Now we'll move into section 4.4 and discuss the indefinite integral. But if you also go back, I pointed this out way, way back in section 3.9, but again, we finally bring all the ideas back together. We've already established the definite integral as this type of setup. Well, the indefinite integral looks very, very similar. It would just be this. So as far as just looking, the difference between, well, they're both integrals and in that they both use that S symbol, but that for the definite integral, we get the bounds on the top and bottom of that S symbol. That's what makes it the definite integral. And we already established that this idea of the definite integral represents the area under the function f of x from x equals a to x equals b. And using the fundamental theorem of calculus as our shortcut, again, reminder, as long as f is continuous between a and b, then we get to use the fundamental theorem, which has us take the antiderivative and then finish by plugging in those bounds. In your book, they very often just skip, skip to this line, but I like to include this line to remind us of the real steps, that we're taking the anti of f, and then we are plugging in the bounds, top bound minus bottom bound. By the way, everybody, that's very easy for people to goof and reverse. For some reason, there's just a large tendency. People want to plug in the a first and then the b, but again, you just get them in the opposite order. So just to be careful here, Unfortunately, there's no way to say, oh, I got a negative answer, so I did them in the wrong order. We've seen that area can be understood to be negative or positive. So again, to make sure we do it in the right order. But now, the indefinite integral. What are we going to use this notation for? Well, we're going to use this notation when all we want is the general antiderivative of f of x. And that's the connection, everybody. These, they mean, they mean completely different things. And when you finish solving a definite integral, you'll end up with some number here at the very end. And again, that number represents an area. But if you have an indefinite integral, all we are going to do is get that general antiderivative. So that's what they have in common. That's why they all fall under integration. Because even though there's more understanding under the definite integral in what it's doing and the purpose it serves, that if we have the opportunity, we're still going to take the antiderivative. So in both senses, that's why the integral symbol for a lot of people kind of becomes notation for take the antiderivative. But no matter what, every time you take an antiderivative, something comes at the end. That when you take the antiderivative, that's when the integral sign and the dx goes away. But at the end, if it's a general antiderivative, if it's an indefinite integral, we have to remember the plus c, the constant of integration. Whereas if it's a definite integral, we still have the extra work of plugging in the B, plugging in the A, and doing the rest of the arithmetic. But that's the connection, everybody. So now one more time, going through everything we've covered in the last few sections. 3.9, we talked about the uh, the idea of the antiderivative. We saw its purpose, reversing the derivative change chain going from f double prime to f prime, from f prime to f, from little f to capital F. And we saw problems, examples trying to get us to do that. Then 4.1, we started talking about area under the curve. We started by approximating. Then 4.2, we introduced the notation for the definite integral. 4.3, we got the fundamental theorem so that we are able to find those areas, the way to solve that integral. And we saw the connection with the antiderivative. And now we circle all around and wrap it together. So, Again, similar notation because of the antiderivative, but that's about it. 
this still leads us to area, a numerical answer, where this, we're getting that general function as our final answer. So that's the big part here, everybody. Now we basically know it, so now it's just establishing that notation. So again, the basic directions, just evaluate, do what it tells you to do. So number one, if I tell you to evaluate 10x cubed minus 5x squared minus 7x plus 12 dx, there are no bounds. So all this is saying is find the general antiderivative of this function. Well, in this particular one, there's not much to it. Everything's separated by addition subtraction. So I just get to do a nice methodical move going left to right being very literal here. I know we've talked about shortcut, uh, not shortcuts, I'm sorry, cleanup here, but just first thing being very literal, the 10 pushes along, I get a 1 fourth x to the fourth for the anti of x cubed. The minus 5 pushes along, I get a 1 third x cubed for the anti of x squared. The minus 7 pushes along, I get a 1 half x squared for the anti of x, and then the plus 12 x but every time, am I done right here? I took an antiderivative, something comes at the end. Well, if this had bounds, if I had a one and a, a two, a negative two to positive five, well, I'd put the bar, I'd put those values, and then I'd still have to plug those in and do the arithmetic. But for this, this was an indefinite integral, so it was just taking the anti plus C. Technically, I'm done right here, but again, just good habits. Instead of 10 times 1 fourth, 10 fourths, or even better, that reduces. It's not beautiful, but 5 over 2. The next one, minus 5 thirds x cubed, minus 7 halves x squared. The 12x was already clean. And we still have the plus c. Okay. So again, that one was pretty nice and neat. We're just going to do a few. Because, again, we've seen plenty of these examples. That's the only thing that's new. When you get to the homework in section 4.4, they, you know, they give you some indefinite integrals, some definite integrals. So just so that you see them mixed together and the reminder of the indefinite, again, you're done here. If you had bounds, you'd have to put those, tail with those. But all the techniques, trig functions, no trig functions, it's all the same. The other thing I should mention is as soon as we establish this notation, the book gives you a chart of antiderivative rules. But we already know the rules. It's just another chart. So they start making this whole big chart and they start putting things like, I won't even put this in the notes. This is just so you can see it a little bit. They start putting things like the anti of sine theta is negative cosine theta plus C. The anti of cosine theta is sine theta plus c. The anti of x to the n is x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus c, so long as n does not equal negative 1. We know all these rules. They're just writing them in an indefinite integral form, but it's still all the same rules we established in 3.9. And that's where I told you, instead of memorizing new rules for an indefinite integral for antiderivatives, just realize you're reversing the process. So instead of getting six new integrals, antiderivatives that go with trig functions, just know your derivatives. The derivative of sine is cosine is the equivalent of this rule. Just go from here to here. Well, cosine has a derivative of negative sine. So that, going from here to here, would give me this rule. So again, we kind of talked about that earlier, but now to formally see it, don't try and memorize a whole new set of rules. We've established all of these. Even the formal properties of the integral of f of x plus or minus g of x is equal to the integral of f of x plus or minus the integral of g of x. Again, we did that for definite integrals based on the ideas of antiderivatives, Technically, it also works thinking about area. But here, that is definitely still a good rule. If I've got c times f of x, the c can go out as a multiplier and then take the anti of f. Everything we established in 3.9 still holds true. So don't let those this not notation throw you off. 
to realize they're still looking for the same things we always have. So back to a few more problems. This one had all the nice addition subtraction. So I didn't set up the integral for each piece separately. I just dove in and started getting to work. If there was multiplication, if there was division, trying to clean those up, radicals, all those things. If you get trig functions, there's got to be a way. Either they're already on your trig derivative chart or there's a way to manipulate them to get them to be on your chart. So again, a lot of ideas to remember to keep track of here, but just seeing them in a slightly different form. We're not really getting anything new this section, except just this new understanding of the indefinite integral, just having this notation. So number two, let's take a look at the indefinite integral of 2x, the quantity 2x minus 5 squared. Well, I can't just jump in and take an antiderivative here because I've got multiplication here. You might say this is inner outer, and you'll see the one thing we're missing that in section 4.5 will be a technique for some slightly harder cases. So we'll come back and look at a problem like this. But again, we could handle this now. Just think of it as 2x minus 5 times 2x minus 5. Notice I haven't dropped my integral symbol because right now I'm just rewriting. And even on my next line, I'm still not taking an antiderivative. Now I'm just literally multiplying this out. So I get a 4x squared. I get a minus 10x and another minus 10x gives me a minus 20x. And I get a plus 25. And now all separated by addition subtraction. Now I'm taking the antiderivative. Now my integral sign drops from the front. My dx drops from the back. I'll get 4 thirds x cubed minus 10x squared plus 25x plus c. Always can check, but just as we've pointed out way back in 3.9, once you start manipulating your check by taking a derivative, it'll only get you back to here. Derivative here does match the 4x squared. Derivative here matches the minus 20x, matches the 25. But if you made a mistake while foiling or anything like that, you wouldn't catch that mistake when you take your derivative. So just to be careful with our rewrites. So let's keep going. Let's just do a couple more here. Number three, we're still just evaluating. Number three, Let's take a look at the integral of 5 sine theta minus 3 cosecant squared theta plus 10. And now I threw some trig functions in here, but they're still nice trig functions, everyone. They're on our trig derivative chart. We've got a sign on the right side. We've got a minus sign goes back to cosine. So a plus sign goes back to negative cosine. So the five pushes along and then my negative cosine, I'm just putting the negative in front of the number. Here, the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. I do have the negative. The three pushes along, but that'll be a plus three cotangent. And now this is super quick. Just go, oh, 10, that gets a 10x. But just to realize here, the variable is theta, not x. So you'll get a plus 10 theta. No more pieces. Am I done? Almost. Just don't forget your plus c. Especially with the trig functions, everybody, I got to be honest. I'm trying to show you how to use the chart and how to think about the negatives along the way. But a lot of people, they check their plus or minuses after that. They know it's definitely cosine. Cosine will have a derivative that gets me to sine. But they may start with five cosine and realize, oh, wait, the derivative of this would be negative five sine. I don't have the negative, so I need the negative here. Similar. Maybe this one, again, that was nicer. The negative was already there, but maybe the three is in your way. So you push the negative three along, and then you think about, well, cotangent has a derivative of negative, but if I already have a negative, that would be a positive. So there again, there's a lot of ways to think about the plus or minuses after to make sure that you got those correct. 
So let's do one more with the trig functions. And let's look at one that's quite honest, a little ugly. Let's take a look at sine cubed divided by one minus cosine squared plus one over one minus sine squared plus cosine squared theta over sine theta d theta. I really threw a lot at you here. But again, it's just, if I'm giving you something, you can make it work, everybody. There is going to be a way that this eventually works with everything that we are given, okay? Oh, I'm sorry, I made one little mistake at the end, though. I'm sorry. I wanted cosine over sine squared. I'm sorry, that was my mistake. So, how does this work? Well, one big aspect is knowing a lot of your basic identities. That when we see things like this, one minus cosine squared, one minus sine squared, those are little modifications, those are little manipulations off of the basic Pythagorean trig identity. And that's by far the most common idea that gets used. I guess maybe some of the cosecant is one over sine, secant is one over cosine. I guess those get used a decent amount. But those little Pythagorean trig manipulations get used quite a bit. So hopefully we see something like this. Our brain is already jumping and saying, oh, that's the same as sine squared. Oh, that's the same as cosine squared. And how much that already does for us. I'm manipulating everybody, so I'm still going to leave my integral sign. I'm not ready for an antiderivative yet because I don't see those basic trig derivatives staring at front of me. But now, sine cubed over sine squared, I could cancel signs, and I'm left with a plain sign. And that, or close enough to something like that, is on my chart. That next, one over cosine squared. Well, one over one minus sine squared is a mess, but one over cosine squared, well, one over cosine is secant. So then that becomes secant squared, which again, that's a good thing. That still looks a little ugly. It still looks like it's got inner outer or still looks like it's being multiplied, but it's on my chart. And this starts to point us in that direction that antiderivatives aren't as clean and perfect as derivatives. That the big picture is can you figure out a function that has that as its derivative? And if the answer is yes, then you can just move forward. If the answer is no, well, then we have to manipulate and see, can I manipulate? Can I multiply? Can I use a trig identity? And now this last one almost feels worse because this last one, and maybe now because you see it once, that'll help jog your memory, but it's all about, can I make these into something on my chart? And these happen a little more naturally, but now if you take a deeper look at this, well, cosine over sine squared can be treated as cosine over sine and push that extra sine in the denominator to the side. And now by doing that, hey, cosine over sine, that's cotangent. And one over sine is cosecant. And that, again, is close enough to something on my chart. A lot of people write it on their chart, cosecant, cotangent, but it's the same thing. A times B, B times A, same thing. And good habits, everybody. Everything we've done, indefinite integral, definite integral, it's easy to think the dx, the d theta, that it's just there for notation. It's not a big deal. But as you get into some of the higher level techniques, again, we'll get one of those in four or five. The others of you who go on to Calc 2, you'll see other techniques. Those dx's and d thetas are not trivial. They are an important part of the notation, and they're a necessary part for some of the higher level techniques that we'll use. So just at this stage, everybody, good habits. Don't lose that. It may seem unimportant. Well, I've got my integral sign. I know I still need the antiderivative. What's the big deal? It becomes a bigger deal going later into the class, going into calculus too. So as a good habit, let's just keep, you know, let's not lose that. Let's not let that drop off in our notation. Okay. But now I'm ready to finish this up, everybody. All this manipulating, but now I've got things right off my chart. The anti of sine 
will take me back to negative cosine. The derivative of positive cosine is negative sine, so that'll give me the extra negative. Here, this is a straightforward. The derivative of tangent gives you secant squared. Here, the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. So negative cosecant will have a derivative positive cosecant cotangent. And I'll still get my plus C at the end. The very last thing. You'll notice a couple of last problems I give you. They're kind of little word problem-ish. But the last thing that this section gets back to, again, the homework, plenty of indefinite integrals, plenty of definite. So we've got a lot of good experience handling both. But the very end, we get a few basic word problems to get us back that a definite integral is not just area, but has some sense of a total. So if I told you that the function f of t represents the rate that a business makes money over time measured in months, is the rate that we make money over time in months. So this would be something like f of 1 equals 22 would mean, you know, we're making money at a rate of $22 per month after one month has passed. That would be the full way to understand that example. So if we were given that and we are asked to interpret the integral of f of t dt from 0 to 4. And when they say interpret, they often tell you to include units. So this would equal, if the function here represents the rate that we make money, we're really looking at one of these setups, everybody. I want this area, but this is a rate. So this is measured in like dollars per month. And my time is measured in months so that that area would be represented by units this times this, and months times dollars per month, the months would cancel, and you'd end up with dollars. So that would represent the total amount of money made. The idea would be over the first four months. And my units here would just be in dollars. But now if I had other examples that if we had a function that this represents the rate that I could memorize words over time measured in hours, so I'm, I can memorize six words per hour, I can mem memorize 25 words per hour, well then what would this be? This would be the total number of words I memorized over my first four hours, and that would just be total words as far as units would be concerned. And we could keep going, but any of these functions where you have some rate of change over time, the integral represents the total of that amount. So earlier we used the example, if this represents the rate, we use water in my apartment building over time, so that this is measured in gallons per hour, and my time is measured in hours. Well, then this would represent the total amount of water used measured in gallons over the first four hours of the day. So again, we're not doing much with word problems here. We're really, really primarily sticking with the concepts of area and antiderivative, but it's still very good to get that sense that this does have a lot of application use and that there is this sense of total.